Welcome everyone. Namaste. I am Ankur Patel, Director of Advancement for Hindu University of America. And today's uh, webinar is on the colonial roots of Hindu Desha. And uh, we're live streaming. This is the second webinar in this important endeavor initiative. And let's just get started right into it. First, we are going to have Sri Kalyan Vishwanathan, who is uh, president of Hindu University of America, laying out some uh, background and, and giving some uh, perspective on this whole webinar. So Kalyanji, why don't you just uh, get right into it? Okay. Terrific. Uh, first of all, I want to extend a very warm welcome to everybody who's joined. Uh, we've just crossed 100 participants, I hope. There'll be more. <clears throat> now, uh, uh, let me share my uh, screen and then uh, I'll share a couple of slides here. So, Hindu Dvesha, the colonial roots of systemic. Hindu phobia. That's the topic of today's webinar. And uh, it is being brought to you by two organizations which are sponsoring it. Uh, one is uh, American Hindus Against Defamation, which is an initiative of the World Hindu Council of America and the uh, Dharma Civilization Foundation. And uh, here is a brief uh, uh, mission statement of both of these organizations. Now, uh, I don't know how many of you had the benefit of uh, participating in the previous webinar, which we conducted about a month ago. Uh, I just want to revisit a few slides from that webinar just to get us going. Uh, Ankur, if you can kindly uh, put a link to the previous webinar in the chat window so that uh, you know, people can, uh, if they missed the previous webinar, they can take a look at it. Okay, now uh, Hindu Dvesha definition. So we are introducing a new word, you know, uh, probably not very popular, not yet at least. And we are hoping that it is, it replaces and at least coexists with the other word that we've been using so far, which is Hindu phobia. And one of the reasons uh, we, uh, you know, we want to move away from that word Hindu phobia is because nobody really is afraid of the Hindus. Uh, I mean, really, there's no, people can get away with anything with the Hindus and uh, Hindus are, uh, as a whole, unable to respond in an organized manner, unable to impose any cost or consequence uh, for the amount of, uh, you know, hatred or vitriol that's coming against the Hindus, coming towards the Hindus almost constantly nowadays. So Hindu Dvesha is a, like systemic racism or anti-Semitism is an ambient, all-encompassing discourse, all-encompassing discourse that denigrates and delegitimizes Hinduism and the Hindu people, even as it relentlessly problematizes, dehumanizes and demonizes them. Its acute, accusatory rhetoric treats Hindus as objects or patients to be examined and diagnosed. It presupposes and concludes that something about the Hindus and Hinduism is irredeemably bad and wrong, evil and demonic. Okay, now these are very strong words and we are using it very deliberately, very consciously and we want to explore these ideas systematically. Now there's an ambient pressure that's exerted by Hindu Dvesha. You know, that pressure seeks to, you know, do something to the Hindus. The Hindus must be secularized. They must be westernized. They must be anglicized, modernized. Or they should be proselytized and converted. Christianized or Islamicized. At least minimally supervised, or at the very least, you know, if nothing else works, then they should be silenced. In other words, the Hindu voice should not be heard at all. 
Everybody else can talk about the Hindus relentlessly. The Hindu voice should be silenced. Now, in the face of this, the, the reaction that Hindus have is that they are ashamed of being Hindu, embarrassed, they won't admit it. They'll pretend we are very secular. They pretend to be westernized, anglicized, modernized, We're vulnerable to being converted, Christianized, uh, constantly supervised. We get confused about our own traditions and culture, feel constantly accused and denounced, we become very defensive. At any rate, we don't speak up. You know, we get definitely silenced. Now, there are two kinds of Hindu dvesha, one that is blatant and the other that is blind. Blatant is conscious and explicit. Blind is unconscious and implicit. But in any case, Hindu Dvesha represents itself as an unbiased, objective truth about the Hindus and relentlessly abuses the Hindus and Hinduism, either deliberately and consciously, or unconsciously and repetitively, just by repeating the same old phrases again and again and again. In fact, every Hindu is being suspected of being a Hindutva person, which means some terribly horrible thing, <clears throat> etc. There are two sources of Hindu Dvesha. Enlightened modernity, and Christian theology. Now, there's of course the Islamic theology. We're not dealing with it today. From the enlightened modernity, you can call it the left. Modernity supersedes tradition. Reason supersedes revelation. Science supersedes superstition. And from that standpoint, Hindus need to be saved or emancipated from Hinduism's own backwardness and primitivity. How? By westernization, by, by modernization, by anglicization, and so on. That's the left. And then, the, and then you have the right, which is Christian theology. Christianity is a true religion. All other, uh, all other religions are false religions. Hinduism is a heathen, pagan religion that needs to be eliminated. And Hindus need to be saved or emancipated from Hinduism's devilish satanic beliefs. So you get this from both left and right. I mean, for Hindus who, who believe it's coming only from one side, it's completely uh, an inadequate understanding. It's coming from both sides. <clears throat> now, the colonial roots of Hindu Dvesha. So we're going to take a quick look at it. And if you look at what happened, you know, and, and honestly, uh, Hinduism has been through three phases of colonialism. The first phase is the Islamic colonialism, which is very, very rampant for a long time in India. And then came the British colonialism. And after independence, it could, we could say, we safely say we've been through a secular colonialism as well. And, you know, we're only beginning to find our voice here. So what happened? Well, and how it generated Hindu Dvesha. There was a colonizer and the colonized. The British clearly were the colonizer and India was colonized. If you to look at it in terms of the Marxist dyad, it was the exploiter and the exploited. Clearly the British were the ex exploiters and the Indians were exploited. How were they exploited? Well, the British extracted some $45 trillion in current day valuation over a 200 year period from India. Now, this is not a some random number. It's a very well uh, developed estimate for how much the British extracted from India uh, through a book that was published very, very recently by Columbia University Press. But how did it generate Hindu Dvesha? Well, two things happened. To look at the Islamic what happened was they did simply destroyed a lot of things. Islam destroyed the universities, colleges, monasteries, temples, centers of learning all over India. And the British, they built up by constructing, through creating universities, colleges, schools. And of course, they created a whole history and a narrative about the Hindus about the Hindu world, about the Hindu people, and so on. So one was 
you know, destroy, destroying through destruction. The other was destroying through construction. Either way, they result in a kind of Hindu Dresha. Now, we're going to zero in on one figure today. There's a gentleman by the name James Mill. Okay, very important. So we'll, we'll zero in on this. Uh, it's an example. Now, he wrote a book called The History of British India and published it in the year 1817. And that's nearly 200 years ago. And so we are going back about 200 years in history. We can go back further in time, but this is a very important uh, occasion, uh, you know, person in the construction of Hindu Dvesha. So here's a, a quotation from his book. Whenever indeed we seek to ascertain the definite and precise ideas of the Hindus in religion, the subject eludes our grasp. All is loose, vague, wavering, obscure, and inconsistent. Their expressions point at one time to one meaning and another time to another meaning. And their wild fictions seem rather the place and whimsies of monkeys in human shape than the serious asseverations of a being who dignifies himself with the name of rational. Okay, it's one quotation. Here's another one. The wildness and inconsistency of the Hindu statements evidently place them beyond the sober limits of truth and history. The Hindu legends still present a maze of unnatural fictions in which a series of real events can by no artifice be traced. The offspring of a wild and ungoverned imagination, they mark the state of a rude and credulous people. This people indeed are perfectly destitute of historical records. So that's the great uh, criticism about about Hindus, we didn't keep proper historical records in the manner in which the, it would have fitted the British taste, so to speak, right? Here's another one. No people, how rude and ignorant soever, who have been so far advanced as to leave us memorials of their thoughts and writing, have ever drawn a more gross and disgusting picture of the universe than what is presented in the writings of the Hindus. In the conception of it, no coherence, wisdom, or beauty ever appears. All is disorder, caprice, passion, contest, portents, prodigies, violence, and deformity. It is perfectly evident that the Hindus never contemplated the universe as a connected and perfected system governed by the general laws and directed to benevolent ends. Okay, these are three different quotations. And there's one more. So here, uh, this is not a quotation per se, but I just collected some adjectives that he uses in his book to describe the Hindus. So Hindus are, according to James Mill, you know, all of these things, imperfect, barbaric, savage, wild, vague, wavering, obscure, rude, primitive, regressive, frivolous, wretched, imbecile, mean, absurd, base, gross, monstrous, superstitious, stupid, degraded, hierarchical, oppressive, immoral, disorderly, violent, selfish, corrupt, deformed, disgusting, groveling, ridiculous, inconsistent, incoherent, ignorant, credulous, timid, dirty, weak, given to exaggeration and flattery, engulfed in darkness and confusion, hardly different from monkeys. So, you know, I mean, there may seem like a lot of adjectives, but I, I uh, you, know, I, you know, trust me when I say Every single one of them can be found in this book, The History of British India, written and published in 1817. Okay, so now I want to introduce to you Dr. Kundan Singh, who's one of the co-doctoral faculty at the Hindu University of America. He holds a PhD in the humanities with a concentration in East-West psychology from California Institute of Integral Studies, San Francisco. He used to teach at the Institute of Transpersonal Psychology also called a Sophia University later on. He's a scholar practitioner of integral yoga and is a devotee of the mother and Sri Aurobindo. Now, I want to stop sharing here and I want to kick this conversation off with a question to Dr. Kundan Singh. Why is James Mill, in your view, so important to understanding the genesis of Hindu Dvesha? With that question, over to you. Dr. Kundan Singh. 
Thank you. Thank you, Kalyanji. Uh, that was a nice introduction. And uh, let me dive into um, the topic um, of today's conversation. So as uh, it was mentioned earlier that James Mill came up with this book, History of British India in 1817. It was published in three volumes um, after 12 years of quote unquote painstaking research. And uh, if these slides are already disgusting you, uh, it would be very difficult for you to wade through seven chapters that he has actually written on the Hindus. And when I assess that book objectively, I consider, consider it nothing short of hate to Tutu. Now, if it was a work of the past, and if it did not serve any relevance today, you know, maybe we would have allowed the book to lie at rest. But the biggest problem that we are facing today is that the narrative continues, the contents of the book get reflected in narratives on Hindus all across the board. But before I get into uh, you know, the history of British India, I just want to give you a brief picture of uh, who James Mill actually was. James Mill was born in 1773 uh, in Scotland. His uh, father was a shoemaker and the mother was the daughter of a farmer. Um, she had an aristocratic background, but interestingly, uh, there was an uprising in which her family had uh, participated in 1745. It's basically called the Stuart Uprising. And in the process, the, uh, the family actually lost uh, aristocracy and uh, the wealth that they had. James Mill's mother was familiar with this background and she basically wanted to regain what her family had lost. So she was very clear right from the very beginning that she did not want to push James Mill in the business of the family, which was shoemaking business and uh, <clears throat> shoe selling business. She wanted him to become a gentleman, meaning an aristocrat. You know, that was, that was the aspiration that she had for James Mill. So there was a lot of emphasis which was placed on James Mill education uh, right from the very beginning. And interestingly, James Mill was a precocious child. He was very good in studies. And he got identified by the local aristocrats, uh, you know, who lived in the vicinity, in the vicinity uh, <clears throat> who wanted James Mill to be educated in a certain way. In fact, uh, the lady aristocrat, you know, wanted him to join uh, ministry, and that is what she thought she would prepare James Mill for. So James Mill, at the expense of uh, uh, these aristocrats, was basically sent to University of Edinburgh, uh, where he did his master's in divinity. Unfortunately, what happened was that he was not able to find uh, any job with the local church. He tried for some time. He tried teaching the children of the aristocrats, and that's how he was making his living, until he decided to come to London in 1802. For the next four years, he spent his time as a journalist writing for different journals and newspapers, uh, <clears throat> making a living. Somehow in 1806, he tumbled upon the idea of writing history of British India, and initially he thought that he would write the book for three, four years, get done with it, and basically continue uh, with his career. But this book, incidentally, took 12 years. Now, when this book came out, you know, um, in early 1818, it was a roaring success. It, it you know, it brought, uh, a lot of uh, fame to James Mill, which endeared him 
to the board of directors of East India Company. And in May 1819, James Mill was hired uh, as an officer in East India Company who would be, uh, you know, situated at India House, which was the headquarters of East India Company in London. Now, by the time it was 1823, James Mill rose to the rank of Assistant Examiner of India Correspondence, which was the number two position in the hierarchy of the highest home position in East India Company. So he rose up the ranks very, very quickly. And he was able to exert a substantive influence on India through East India Company. And when we look at the records which uh, have been left by his contemporaries, uh, one of them being uh, you know, his own son, John Stuart Mill, the famous John Stuart Mill, who uh, you know, was, was considered the philosopher as far as uh, the liberal values and liberal uh, philosophies, uh, or rather liberal philosophy is concerned. In that, James Mill exerted a massive influence on the policies and uh, policies of India and the history of British India basically became the primary book for making structural changes in governance and rule of India. We'll revisit this topic later, you know. But I also want to make it clear that this book, or rather, you know, these three volumes, History of British India, uh, became the required reading for English civil servants who were going to serve East, East India Company, uh, you know, who were getting trained at Hellebury College, a college which had, which, which, which had, which had been uh, established by East India Company in England. Now, Ronald Inden in Imagining India calls this text, History of British India, as a hegemonic text. And why does he call it a hegemonic text? Because as I told you earlier, there are seven chapters on Hindus uh, in this particular text. And as uh, Kalyanji pointed out, there are different ways in which Hindus are described as rude, savage, barbaric, uncouth, and so on and so forth. You know, you you saw the uh, various synonyms of the word sav savage. Now, one of the primary modes in which the description was 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 made was that Hindus are hierarchical and oppressive, and Hindus have been hierarchical and oppressive right from the very beginning. So in the first chapter itself, you know, uh, uh, James Mill makes this point that because Hindus are savage, they don't have any sense of history. In the second chapter, this is the core of the contention. Hindus are, are savage because they have an hierarchical and oppressive social system. In the third chapter, he basically describes the forms of governance of the Hindus as hierarchical and oppressive. Again, within the context of barbarism and savagery. In the next chapter, he takes up the issue of taxation. Once again, you know, the system of tax taxation is hierarchical and oppressive, which basically uh, uh, helps, you know, a few people within the society. 
what he's basically saying is that this was a society where few were ruling over the many in a very very despotic manner in the subsequent chapter he talks about the laws of the hindus and here he basically goes into uh, manus dharma shastra and twisting and uh, you know turning the the contentions of uh, uh, manus dharma shastra he makes this point that the laws of hindus right from the very beginning have been hierarchical and oppressive in the last two chapters you know he is basically talking about the manners uh, of the hindus uh, you know he also makes certain comments about hinduism as a religion and there also it's the same story he gives significant space you know to describing hindus as women oppressors so in a certain sense you know i'm giving you a synopsis of the 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 description now i explained to you that because of the position that james mill acquired you know by becoming an important official in east india company through the research and subjects and subsequent publication that he had done he was able to induce organizational and structural changes in india which deformed the indian social system in a very very big way you know i'm uh, because of lack of time i'm not going to uh, go into uh, those details today you know because i'm 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 mainly going to talk about his influence on the discourse which actually exists and how this discourse has been transferred to what we find in contemporary times now there are a couple of things that happened you know his research was picked up by hegel and as many of you would know hegel influenced marx so the writings and contentions of james mill travel through hegel to marx marx was also in london uh, after the death of james mill which happened in 1836 for about 20 years and when you look at uh an article which he wrote for one of the the newspapers in new york you see clear evidence of james mill on that piece because he is de- describing indian society run by oriental despotism he again replicates this narrative that the hindu society is predominantly and primarily hierarchical and oppressive so you see the transmission you know of his thoughts to marx and i i should not uh, you know uh, emphasize this in that the left thought that you find in academia at this point in time has basically been formulated by marx so if you if you want to understand left thought in contemporary times you have to go to marx you know that is the transmission so this entire left, left narrative which is operational in academia at this point in time you know basically regurgitates what james mill wrote 200 years ago and that is the reason when you look at the textbooks for children in the united states 
you will see that the entire narrative on Hinduism revolves around this particular equation. Hinduism equals caste system, equals hierarchy, equals oppression. That is precisely what is occurring. Now, there was, there was another channel, you know, which actually got opened up in Britain. James Mill's literary career did not end with history of British India. Between 1821 and 1824, he published some articles uh, you know, for supplement to Encyclopedia Britannica. And in these pieces, he was basically arguing for representative governance, liberty of press, freedom of expression, universal suffrage, which were non-existent in England of that particular time, you know? England was ruled by what you would consider as political right. India, uh, uh, Britain was ruled by uh, monarchy with the support of clergy and aristocracy. So all these wonderful ideas which have become part of democracy today were literally non-existent in Britain. And James Mill was basically arguing for these. Now in 1825, James Mill and the group with which he was working decided to put together University of London. Now through University of London, you know, which incidentally was established in opposition to Oxford University and Cambridge University, also incorporated the thoughts of James Mill, which included his thoughts articulated in history of British India. So you see how you know the the ideas are actually developing and how ideas are basically finding traction. Later, Oxford University Press and Cambridge University Press came with their own editions of history of British India. And when you compare you know, these books with what uh, James Mill produced, you will see that the plan that James Mill had put in place is actually getting replicated in these publications. Eighteen fifties onwards, institutions and universities began to get established in India. And history of British India and other publications from Oxford University Press and Cambridge University Press began to find traction in the curriculum which was meant for Indians. And that is how the narrative which James Mill had put in place began to actually get internalized, replicated, and reproduced. In fact, Kalyan Vishwanathan has done uh, some research, you know, and uh, he, uh, he analyzed Jawaharlal Nehru's history of, uh, sorry, discovery of India. 
And there are many passages in Discovery of India, which are exact replications of what you find in history of British India. So I want to emphasize this point that whatever was put in place by James Mill continues in post-colonial India because, his, because discovery of India remained a very, very important text. And after 1970s, the left historians or the Marxist historians, they took over the Indian intellectual scene. And all these forces, you know, basically began to combine. And that is why both in India as well as in the United States, what you find in contemporary times is replication of the same discourse which had been put together by James Mill long time ago. Of course, you know, this narrative has been sanitized. It has been made politically correct. You know, no scholar uh, will basically call Hindus savage, regressive, uncouth, rude, barbaric, and so on and so forth. But all the characteristics that were used to define Hindus as savages and, bar and, 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 and barbarians, they remain in place. They are being replicated. And that is why, you know, children growing up in this country get badly affected by the discourse which gets introduced to them from sixth grade onwards. And what does this narrative do to them? It produces inferiority complex, it produces shame, and it produces guilt. And many of them struggle with these things for their entire lifetimes. And that is why it becomes extremely important that we critically examine this text. We critically examine, you know, what James Mill wrote on Hindus and India 200 years ago. And enumerate the various ways in which the replication of this discourse continues in contemporary times. In fact, you know, after having researched this field for close to two decades now, I can safely say that whenever you will find a Hindu Dweshik content in academia or media, you will be able to find its connection with the writings of James Mill. It's a tall claim to make, you know, and I'm making this claim publicly, but it's true. It's true, it can be, it can be validated. And that is why Hindus at this point in time need to read those seven chapters that have been written by James Mill. And what we call in academic parlance, start deconstructing the Hindu Dweshik discourse in the light of narrative put forth by James Mill. You know, at Hindu University of America, we have created a program titled Post-Colonial Hindu Studies, which specifically does this. I will stop here, you know, maybe 
Ankur uh, later can give more details of the program. But what I'm saying is that <clears throat> in order to get beyond this problem that we are facing, we will have to engage in systematic study of what was written about us in the past. And, and you know, and there's, there's one last point that I, I, I want to uh, emphasize and point out. This narrative has been appropriated by liberal left. So when we criticize or critique this narrative, it is extremely important that we do not categorize ourselves or define ourselves as right. Because as Kalyan pointed out earlier, both the left as well as the right have been complicit in perpetuating the Hindu Dveshik content which is there in academia as well as media. And with that, I stop. Okay, terrific, Kundan. Thank you. Thank you so much for that uh, discourse. We got a lot more to cover here. So please, everybody st uh, stay for the, we may go a little bit over time, okay? So everybody, please uh, uh, stay back uh, for a few minutes. So now uh, we will go to uh, Ram, uh, Ram Sundar uh, ji. Um, Ram Sundar is going to uh, talk about the consequences, the psychological consequences of Hindu Dvesha on the Hindus from a post-colonial perspective. Uh, Ram Sundar ji, can you please introduce yourself briefly and then uh, go from there? I'll, I'll share the screen which you're going to be speaking from. Oops, sorry. There you go. You have to unmute yourself if you're on mute. Yes, yeah. Can you get to that uh, slide, uh, Kalyan? Yeah, there you go. Yes, yeah. My name is uh, Kalyan. How much uh, time do I have? You, know, you can take uh, five, six minutes. No problem. Okay, all right. You know, what we have seen so far is the distortion and the demonization of our religion has had a debilitating impact on our mind. You know, I'd like to start with this quote that I have uh, just put up on the uh, screen. Aims desire is a francophone scholar of Caribbean descent, you know. He makes a very telling remark in his, uh, in his book, Discourse on Colonialism. He says, it's a prelude to disaster and a forerunner of catastrophe, you know. That's basically what happened to India, Indians, and Hindus. It's kind of reflected in our state of mind. And I want to explore that in the context of uh, Hindu Dvesha. Can you go to the next slide, uh, Kalyan? Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. See, a colonized mind, you know, it's a conditioned mind, you know, it's uh, caught in a vicious cycle, you know, it suffers from inferiority complex, it carries a very, very low self-esteem, and most importantly, it lives on borrowed cosmology. I'm going to give you some examples, run through some points here, you know. Uh, we have developed self-hatred and self-doubt and ignorance of our own religious and traditions. You know, it kind of impact us pretty much on a daily, you know, day to day basis. We don't realize it. We are extremely defensive about our own traditions, especially when it comes to caste or women's rights. When those two are brought into the discourse, we actually become very defensive here in the US. You know, see, Kamala Harris became a VP only today when women in position of power. It's not new to India, Hindus or Indians, you know, but we don't seem to be articulating that point very well, actually. That's what. Second one is we look for validation from the West always. Uh, I do know, I think many of us would have heard of two recent instances when, uh, when Tamil and Kannada chair were set up in some of these universities here in the US. I think one was in Harvard, another was in Columbia, if I'm, if I may, if I'm not wrong. We have outsourced our interpretation to outsiders because we don't know about us ourselves, actually. That's the second point I want to make. We are extremely defenseless, you know, defenseless against pernicious attacks on our religions, you know. 
there are several Christian TV channels. I'm sure we have all seen that before. Uh, they have their ulterior motives. They were at the forefront of distorting, demonizing, and denigrating our Hindu culture. We have remained silent for way too long, actually, because we don't know what to respond, what to respond, and how to respond. Another interesting one is, you know, many of us would have seen, and you know, many of I have actually seen, I have this experience. Many Indians, when they come over to the U.S., they develop fake accents. In fact, they have more accent than grammar. In fact, you know, I don't know what is the necessity to develop a fake accent. They are not confident of their own language, grammar, so on and so forth. They do that actually. That's as a result of inferiority complex. There is always a compulsion, right, to assimilate with words. I'm not saying everybody does it, but a lot of them actually, you know, they suffer from inferiority complex. They can exhibit some of these uh, characteristics with such a mind, right? A mind, you know, we only develop low self-esteem. There's a lack of self-confidence, you know, if at work, I'm sure we all have that experience where we have seen our own co-workers or Indians who lack that self-esteem, self-confidence, they're not able to articulate themselves properly, even in their day-to-day -day lives. Okay? Because of this, well, we begin to live on borrowed cosmology, right? Our worldview and worldview about us is always on Eurocentric framework, you know, uh, our interpretations, the interpretations of Hindu society Using is always using alien context terms such as left, right, center, nationalism, or even secularism for that matter. They don't apply to us actually. There are a lot more powerful components within our own framework. We are not able to articulate it. Our tradition is extremely diverse and very pluralistic, you know. But the current discourse in the mainstream media here in the US and in the social media is very Eurocentric. It drowns pluralism, which is embodied in our culture. We are not able to articulate that better because we don't, we don't, or we have not examined some of these things very critically. So we rely on borrowed cosmology. You are extremely defenseless against fear mongering over nationalism. Nationalism, sure, yes, in the European context has had a negative connotation, but in the Indian context, it's rooted in independence movement. We have a very superficial view of it, actually. We have not critically examining, we have not critically examined these so that we could articulate our Indic viewpoint much better. We have not done that. So we continue to rely on borrowed cosmology. Even just recently last year, there were a lot of CAA protests that played out. They were all based on alien framework, European framework, right? Secularism, nationalism, fear mongering over all of it continues to, you know, uh, the Western media continues to employ these frameworks. And the borrowed cosmology is used to interpret India. As long as it does, I think it will continue to remain the same. You know, there are many such examples I think I can give that shows the subservient nature of a Hindu mind. A colonized mind is a conditioned mind. It's doctored, I think, from its cardinal basis, right? This mind as we have just heard from Kalyan's uh, opening remarks, as well as uh, Professor Kundal Singh's uh, remarks, right? This mind interprets India from a colonial perspective. It's oblivious of its ancient uh, traditions and is extremely defenseless against a France to our own primordial identity. You know, we are actually ambassadors of our own civilization. You know, The damage, the psychological damage inflicted upon us has turned us into very bad ambassadors, I think, you know? We need to effect a change, I think, in that regard. Just to review what I had said, the impact has been very debilitating. And I want to just close my remarks by saying we suffer from inferiority complex. We carry a very low self-esteem. We live on borrowed cosmology and we need to effect a change. Wonderful, uh, Dr. Thank you so much. Uh, I'll make one more comment on this. Uh, you know, uh, one of the ways Hindu Dvesha manifests within the Hindu community is when Hindus turn on one another viciously. In fact, they, Hindus themselves become perpetrators of Hindu Dvesha. And, you know, for the most part, we don't know where we are getting it from. We're getting it from a whole ontology, you know, a, a, a framework of understanding things that's borrowed from a Western cosmology and we use it to analyze and, and dissect and denigrate ourselves without recognizing the, the harm that that's causing. All right, wonderful. Let's go to the next speaker now. Uh, now I want to invite uh, Padmaja Rao. 
she's born and raised in the united states and she's going to speak about some personal experiences of hindu desha next padma ja over to you current day reality okay you're on mute yourself thank you so much kalyan ji i would like to thank hindu university of america first of all for inviting me to share some of my experiences as they relate to hindu desha um i've experienced hindu desha or hate for hindus uh or fear of uh or hate hate for hinduism not fear of hinduism i've experienced hindu desha in different forms my experiences of it growing up have been different from what i've experienced as an adult um today i'd like to share three of those experiences that i've had as an adult the first two coming from a professional setting and the third one from a social perspective so i'll begin with the situations um i faced at two different jobs where i worked so situation 1 where i experienced uh hindu hate occurred with someone i had considered a friend um obviously when we first met she did not reveal her dvesha or her hatred which is why i had thought of her as a friend prior to this incident she and i had had a lot of great conversations one of which centered around our mutual love for singing uh she had one point during our conversations even mentioned that she was she mentioned in passing that she was a born again christian which i did not have any issue with because i thought she was simply providing her background um and in the same vein i had mentioned to her that i am a a uh, hindu i'm a i'm i'm an american hindu however her dvesha was made very clear to me the day that she told me that it was her duty as a friend to convert me uh prior to this declaration of hers she had come to my desk to invite me to accompany her to her church and at that moment i still didn't think anything of it because in my mind we were friends and implied in friendship is mutual respect and liking for a person based on who they are plus i had gone to church before with other friends um but they also accompanied me i made sure that they accompanied me to my uh you know temple mandir cultural events and these friends have also been genuinely interested in learning about hinduism anyway this particular individual then started to tell me that it was her duty as a friend to share the light with me that light being jesus she told me that she follows a religion that is 100% and i'll never forget this she stated she follows a religion that is 100% and told me while you may believe you are following god your religion is 99% and we all know 99% she told me we we all know 99% 99% belongs to satan Now I was stunned. I felt shock at first because you know it was a comment that came out of the blue. Uh and we had never talked about this before. Um and she never had struck me as a harsher judgmental person. But of course what she said to me I felt very judged. I also felt anger at the proselytization efforts. And then during that exchange I immediately realized I was dealing with a very ignorant and religiously arrogant person. Uh so that was that was uh so I of course I ended the the quote friendship it wasn't really even a friendship the second situation i experienced hindu dvesha at work was in the university setting so the irony here is that higher education is looked upon at least in theory anyway as being a bastion of open ideas and learning the department where i had worked a supervisor who identified as as a very strong christian never let a day go by without showing the staff that she's better than everyone because she found god she would actually be singing songs in the office about jesus you know and she was mixing uh secular and and uh and religious now i decided uh you know i i wouldn't participate in any of that and i wouldn't participate in conversations with her during one particular christmas season she and another staff member who even though she was married to a person from a different faith they expected me to help decorate a tree that was brought into the office telling me that i needed to get into the christmas spirit mind you in our office at the time all of us the staff were comprised of people of all different faiths plus my colleagues including my supervisor knew that i am hindu so i was shocked when she said this to me 
My supervisor also, she didn't ask or expect my Muslim American colleagues to participate in decorating the, the tree. I refused to help decorate the tree and I went into my office to start my work day. Um, my supervisor became visibly upset and she stopped speaking to me for a while. And it wasn't that I had a problem decorating something. I had refused to help decorate this particular tree in the office out of principle. The supervisor associated decorating a tree with worshiping Christ and never stopped talking uh, about how her church would continuously give money to the poor Hindus in India. So, you know, I was very bothered by that incident. Um, and even though I wanted to tell her off, she was my boss. So I felt very trapped. And I was also angry because here is this woman, a white Christian woman who was imposing her religious values, banking on her white Christian privilege. She was imposing her religious values onto me and blending her personal life values to her professional life, knowing full well, or at least banking on her privilege. And she knew that she was not going to be reprimanded by human resources for creating a hostile work environment. So that was, uh, that was the second, that was a second Hindu Dvesha incident that sticks out in my mind. The last example I wanted to share was what I experienced from a social perspective. Um, I used to socialize with a large group of individuals from a variety of backgrounds, ethnicities, religions, you name it, who, by the way, can all boast highly educated, highly educated backgrounds, one even being a university professor. But as I found out very quickly, one can have a degree or degrees, plural, and still engage in religious bigotry. This large group of friends were comprised of individuals, uh, you know, as I said, from different religions, but folks at this particular gathering that I wanted to share information about, this particular gathering happened to be majority uh, Muslim friends, Muslim American friends. One day at one of their homes, we were having a discussion about something or another, but the conversation quickly turned to religion. We had all enjoyed hanging out for many years, so I was very shocked at the manner in which people started bringing this up. So my so-called friends started questioning me about my Hindu beliefs based on what they thought Hinduism is about. So there was already a built-in condescension in their questioning. So it's, it's like they were, they were not coming from a place of genuine curiosity. They kept asking me while laughing, so why do you all worship cows? What is the point of having a red dot? What good does that do? And they kept saying, you're a heathen. You're, you're a heathen. You're a heathen. That's, during that time, I, that's, that's the phrase that just kept ringing in my ears. Um, they were not interested in hearing my responses to their questions. Um, I definitely stood my ground as I was getting over the shock of being verbally attacked. Uh, I guess you can say I felt like Abhimanyu by the end of it all, except my life was spared. Of course, I responded back because I always saw myself as coming from a place of being equals with who I thought were friends. So I was very shocked. And I did say, I'm paraphrasing, you know, I do remember saying, you know, guys, this won't be an intelligent conversation because you are operating, you are all operating from a place of ignorance. I can name off basic tenets and historical information about your faith, but from the way all of you are speaking to me, you have no idea what you're talking about. And aside from feeling sad about what transpired, I also felt uh, righteous anger because I term it as religious supremacy. And I was dealing with people who I thought were friends, good friends, who were telling me, they were showing me that they came with a religious supremacist attitude. So what these and other incidents of Hindu Dvesha or Hindu hatred, what they've shown me is that I am more determined more than ever to continue to proudly identify as an American Hindu or Hindu American. Okay. Thank you. Very good. Very good. Pradija. Thank you. <clears throat> Uh, we, we've got a couple more quick shares from uh, Venkat, Venkat Nagarajan and then followed by Ankur Patel. Uh, Venkat, Venkat uh, keep it brief if you can, please. Sure. Yeah. yeah. So, uh, I mean, this is, I'm just sharing an indirect experience. So the portrayal of Hindus by James Mill, uh, the portrayals of Hindus by James Mill continue to be championed today in the mainstream media. Over the last couple of years, you know, Hindu Dvesha and the media has escalated 
There have been numerous, um, <clears throat> there have been and continue to be numerous anti-Hindu news and opinion articles in all the mainstream media outlets. And as a Hindu American, I was deeply offended and upset by these, what I call frivolous, unethical and biased articles. Most of these pieces were filled with baseless exaggerations about India and Hindu culture. Um, they also contained bigoted or racist statements about Hindus and belittled and demeaned things that are sacred to us. So I, I, I'm just gonna quickly highlight a particular article which I view as one of the most egregious examples of Hindu dvesha. So um, the Atlantic Magazine published an article titled Modi's Kashmir Decision in the, late, uh, the Latest Step in Undoing Nehru's Vision on August 5th, 2019. This article was written by um, an individual, <clears throat> individual named Krishna Dev Kalamur, who is now the deputy Washington editor for NPR. In this article, Mr. Cullimore insinuated that the BJP governments and hundreds <clears throat> and the hundreds of millions of Indian citizens who voted for them are overwhelmed with fanciful ideas and obsessed with drinking cow urine to maintain good health. This wild and baseless exaggeration, which was um, supported by flimsy evidence, is also a slight against all Hindu Americans who have a favorable disposition towards the BJP or India's current prime minister. So I, I read many such articles and tried to respond with well-crafted letters to the editor, calling out factual inaccuracies, misrepresentations and bigotry, but not one of them was published. You know, I, I tried to bring <clears throat> these articles to the attention of other Hindu Americans and ask them to respond with letters of their own. And you know, many members of the community were either indifferent or willing to accept some of these articles, uh, some the validity of some of these articles. So um, reading these anti-Hindu articles and not having any recourse and the witnessing the community's apathy caused me a great deal of trauma. And you know, as, as a result, I no longer read many mainstream publications. I also stopped using Facebook and quit most WhatsApp discussion groups you know, this is, I'm just sharing my own experience of Hindu Dvesha. Terrific. Great. I mean, uh, both Padmanja and Venkat are examples of, uh, you know, people born and raised, Hindus born and raised in America, who are Americans more than anything else uh, first. And, you know, when they get attacked like this in the media, it's often not very clear where it's coming from and the history of Hindu Dvesha, for example, right? <clears throat> Okay, now uh, our own Ankur Patel has a couple things to share as well. Ankur, your turn, please. Yeah, so growing up in America, disrespect of foreign civilizations is baked into the education system at all levels. Starting in elementary school, I was taught a history built on white supremacism. We learned all about Columbus sailing west across the Atlantic in three tiny ships to trade with Indians, but we got pablum on how the Christian, Catholic, capitalist, settler colonizers used manifest destiny to expand their dominion while the Indian was eradicated from their new world. But in elementary school, we're taught Indians helped the pilgrims at Thanksgiving. In reality, it was 300 years of near genocide against the indigenous people of this land, the American Indians. The public education system facilitates the erasure of real history and the conflation of the Hindu and Indian identities. We weren't even given a hint of the hundreds of millions of Hindus who were murdered, captured, enslaved in order to create the Mughal Empire, right? We don't even learn about that at all. In middle school, it is not just the biased history, but the accumulating microaggressions in popular culture where we only had Apu at the 7-Eleven with a hard accent to the continued bullying of Hindu youth to this day, we're only scratching the surface. We're going from Columbus sailed the ocean blue in 1492 to Columbus sold nine-year-old Indian girls into sexual slavery. It is written in his own words in his journals. And Mahmud of Ghazni is very much like Christopher Columbus in that he documented his barbarity against Hindus in his own words, in his own journals. Yet they try to portray us as the patriarchal beast. The colonial roots of Hindu Dvesha goes deep in the education system. In high school, the first advanced placement course I took was European history. It is no accident or lie that winners write the history. 
but they also project their narrative. I didn't get a real understanding of Bharat or Hindu history until recently, thanks to independent reading and because of the Hindu University of America. And in academic spaces, we are ridiculed for using Bharat, while the Caliphate, the Mughal Empire, Zion, Mecca, Aslan, Khalistan, Zhongguo, other civilizations celebrate and are allowed to celebrate, encouraged to celebrate the names they give their aspirational selves and societies. In college, there is no Hindu history, but there are some South Asian studies. There's definitely Jewish studies and Muslim studies in hundreds of Christian universities, Catholic colleges, divinity programs, you name it. When I was at the University of California, Los Angeles, UCLA and CSUN, Cal State Northridge, I was not aware of the Hindu Students Council. It existed, but I was not aware of it. But I was aware of the Muslim Students Association and the dozens of Christian clubs. Having gone through the American public education system, I know we need a Hindu University of America. I know Hindu Dvesha exists and has been cultivated in the public education system, not just in America, but all over Europe, all around the world, including in India with our first education minister, right? Abdul Kalam Azad. White Christian America had a general disrespect for other cultures and civilizations, but many have stood up and gained stature through civil rights movement, through protests, through myriads of tactics and strategies. But we as Hindus haven't stood up yet. We haven't gotten our act together. We haven't even convinced the majority of Hindus that Hindu Dvesha exists, right? We're talking about in the chat, should we even call it this? What is it? It exists in this complicated and nefarious way. In this webinar, your word of mouth is another step in changing that narrative and I'm happy and proud to be a part of it. Back to you, Koyaji. Terrific, terrific. Uh, you know, see, I, I think see, this, is a, this is a difficult conversation. So I want to remind everybody in the, uh, in the, in, who are participating today, right? See, you know, the first instinct of Hindus coming and living in America is to try to be as white as possible, try to earn the respect of the white Americans, try to earn this, this, the esteem and respect, you know? And, uh, uh, you know, it, it is, uh, that itself is part of uh, the colonized uh, mind, you know, when, you, when, you, when we try to, uh, you know, look, uh, uh, look up to the white people and want their appreciation and, and want their, their uh, acknowledgement and so on. So um, uh, in a minute, I'm gonna ask Ankur to put up a survey for you to fill out, okay? Just a very quick survey. You can bring it up Ankur, but I'll, 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 let's go on to another speaker now. Uh, this is Dr. Indrani Ram Prasad from the Caribbean islands. Indrani ji, over to you, please. Keep it short, okay? Let unmute yourself, Indran. Unmute yourself. And please, uh, please fill out the answers to the questions, okay? Please, kindly. Yeah, yeah go ahead, Indran. Thank you to all. I don't know why my video keeps tapping on its own. Yeah, namaste to all. Um, uh, can you share my... Yeah, I will. Yeah, go ahead, please. No, uh, okay, great. So I'm sharing uh, an experience that I had as a teacher in a New York City high school. My student, uh, this student was mixed of, uh, I suspect a Hindu background, uh, definitely Indian and African. And she says to me, I don't like you because you are a Hindu. My mom says you Hindus are devil worshippers. So my response was, I'm sorry you feel that way. I think we should speak with the guidance counselor on this. Now I put my little emoji there. I was not angry because I'm the adult in this situation. I felt deep pain and deep sorrow and deep sympathy for this child that I was looking at and could see how she, her mind was was torted, you know, uh, with religion. Uh, she she come from a Pentecostal background, and uh, I had the dad come in, and the dad was so embarrassed. He's like, "I never taught you this." The the mom and the dad had split, so she, I never taught you this. And here was the child, you know, with with a, a different kind of um of mindset. And we all come from the Caribbean, mind you. 
And then this other kid of mine, uh, he is mixed. He was like Rastafari. And I suspect his mom was Christian. He says to him, Miss, are you Kuli? Mm -hmm. And I was like, yes. You remember what that means in Trinidad, right? Now, the word Kuli in Trinidad is a derogatory term, as you would say the N-word in America. For us, it's a, it's a deeply um, a problematic term. But over the years, just like, just like an in-group would use the N-word for themselves, I learned that when I came teaching and the kids would use the N-word and I was like, no, you can't say that. Miss, we can say that to ourselves. Other people can't say that to us. You know, and in Trinidad, it was the same thing because we can use this word and we even use it now in Trinidad, really. Both we can use, if we are of the in-group, then you don't feel any kind of, um, you know, uh, that negative feeling. So this kind of showed me here, I was the adult. And these were kids mm. who could so openly demonstrate a level of dwesha of, of, of their teacher's um, identity. You know, that, that, that was very troubling. But like I said, I did not feel anger because I was a teacher, but I have been subject to, to this in the adult world. And I've dealt with it as I've told my colleagues here at, at Hindu University of America, I've learned to be a bully over the years. That if you bully me, I bully you right back. And I've stood my ground for all the years I've been on this earth. Since 1985, I've been fighting this battle. When I, when I took up the battle of black and Indian, I was the first in Trinidad to do so. I said, I'm not black, I am Indian. Show me one sugar worker on his plantations who tell you that he is a black. He doesn't even say East Indian. He says, I am Indian. We don't say East Indian, that comes from the university. I want to I wanna just quickly um, introduce you to a text that was deeply problematic in Guyana. And I have not been able to read it yet, but it's a text written by a professor, Kian Gibson, who's a lecturer at the University of Trinidad and Tobago. And many Guyanese have been telling me about this. She wrote about the cycle of racial oppression in Guyana. And she has brought it down to Hindu racism. She said all of this, she wrote two books, and all of it is caused because of the Hindu beliefs. In fact, the university had to stand out against her, you know, and says you can't um, write that. And we had, uh, they had a couple of um, to and fro with it, but she still, she still has her book out there. But she very openly, Hindu Duisha, it is the Hindus who are the cause of racism in Guyana. Now in Guyana, those of you who might know the, the politics recently where the government, the last government refused to, to surrender to, to the government that won here in Guyana. And um, it was an Indian nominated government and eventually the whole world stood up. And um, so that, uh, that government is in power now. Indians are the largest ethnic group there, 44%. And the afro guyanese are 30%. So you can understand the little, um, you, you know, uh, problems we have. And in Trinidad, we too, we are 35.4% Indians and 34.2% African. And the rest are rising mixed community. So you can see the dynamics that, that's happening and the duration that is likely to get even more and more overt and, and systemic, you know, we face it in the, in the world of jobs and so on, but that's the a common experience. So I'll end there with that. Thank you very much. Terrific, thank you. Thank you so much, Indranji, thank you. So we wanna uh, go ahead and wrap up the webinar in a few minutes. Uh, 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 I'd like to gently remind everybody to fill out the survey, please, if you haven't, we'd like to get a response from you. You can say no to all the questions, that's fine too. Kindly respond. And uh, you know, in order to bring the webinar to a closure, uh, I, I'll hand it over to Dr. Jay Bunsell, uh, who is the other uh, co-sponsor uh, of this webinar. Uh, Dr. Bunsell, over to you. Uh, thank you so much, Kalyanji. Uh, so, uh, namaste to everyone. 
I guess it's my job to bring up the rear uh, and uh, try to uh, bring this uh, uh, event to a closure. Um, you might be wondering why we've been dredging this old history uh, on the roots of Hindu Dvesha. Uh, the reason is uh, we are constantly being asked why Hindus are, uh, you know, singularly pointed, you know, for, uh, are the objects of uh, this, this hateful narrative in this world, whereas other minority communities are not. And uh, we felt it is important for us to uh, remind ourselves uh, how it got started and how it got translated into uh, the modern day experience, which basically is really a transformation of the same narrative uh, into today's world. Uh, the other um, question that came up at the last webinar was, well, you know, I've spent uh, many years in this, in the Western world, and I've never experienced Hindu Dvesha in my working life or social life. And so we thought we will try to bring you face to face with some personal experiences uh, from a variety of uh, domains so that you can see that uh, Hindu Dvesha truly does exist. And it exists in a pretty virulent way. It's just that some of us are lucky not to see it or maybe our antennas are not finely tuned enough to, to be able to experience it. So, uh, JD, one, one, let me make one point about that, okay? Yeah. <clears throat> see, if, if a person, if as you as a person, if you feel embarrassed about being Hindu, if you feel unable to speak up as a Hindu, if you're, if you're in some shape or form uh, ashamed of being Hindu, or if you feel silenced as a Hindu, or if you're interrogated or put on the defensive as a Hindu, as a Hindu. See, many people who say, I have lived here 30, 40 years, I have never experienced Hindu dvesha. See, Hindu, Hindus are very much respected as doctors and engineers and business people and academics. Uh, and, and, and a variety of other things, you know, as professionals, we are very respected. But it's as a Hindu that we have to confront this Hindu Dvesha. And if you feel unable to transmit your culture safely and securely to, to your children, mm -hmm. and if you feel that there is a, a kind of gentle, subtle, but ambient and relentless pressure on the younger generation being less and less and less Hindu as time goes by, that's and that's the effect of Hindu Dvesha. It is subtle, sometimes it is very overt, but much of the time it is subtle and it is it's like an ambient pressure. Okay, well, oh, back to you, Jay. Okay, okay. thank you, Kalanji. Yeah. yeah, so uh, I have a, a kind of a pretty leading question here. You know, how do you tame an elephant? I mean, you see this elephant being tied to a very uh, tiny, uh, through a tiny rope to a very uh, flimsy uh, stake. Obviously, you know, uh, the elephant is very, you know, can easily uh, run away. But the only way you can control this, uh, you know, big beast is by messing up with his mind. By making him believe somehow that he is powerless. He has no options. He is nothing, no better than a sheep. And that is, I think, what has uh, happened to uh, Hindu community at large. So um, uh, next slide, please. So, uh, you know, Hindu mind could not have been an easy target for subjugation. When you look at the, the conditions, I mean, the level of education that actually existed in India, and this is this, this is coming actually from British colonial records because a uh, lot of lot of Indians and Hindus don't don't tend to believe what you know our own statistics so I thought we'll dredge up actual British colonial records they talk about they state the mass education in early 1800s was actually more advanced and widespread in India than in England on a number of axes number of schools number of students, duration uh, in school, quality of teachers, and so on and so forth. And here is actually a report that you can Google for yourself that uh, from 1838 that talks about how many schools existed in just the two states, Bengal and Bihar in 1830s, over 100,000 schools. Okay, so, you know, here's a highly you know, educated population, uh, you know, sophisticated mind with a very sophisticated social structure. 
it must have been difficult, a very monumental task for them to actually subjugate our minds. And yet they managed to do it uh, because the force of the uh, the British Empire was behind it. Next slide, please. Yeah, one, one more comment about this slide. Um, see, the the if supposing we had quoted an Indian scholar, you know, and in, instead of this fellow William Adam here, right? If we, if we had quoted an Indian scholar, half the half the people in this webinar would have said, "We don't believe that guy. Where's the evidence?" <laughs> but we think that because it's William Adam saying, you know, there ought to be some credibility to it. That itself is an example of Hindu Dvesha right there. Okay. Absolutely, absolutely. And that, that, that is exactly the point I was trying to make earlier. Yeah. Uh, but obviously it did happen. They did, did manage to subjugate us. They did manage to subjugate our minds. Uh, you know, this circular attack that, that kept on year after year after year with the full force of, uh, you know, the, the, the British, uh, I mean, including the government behind it, uh, did manage to accomplish its objective, which was the pervasive colonization of, of our minds. And the impact, as uh, Ramji has earlier pointed out, on, on, on Hindu society is nothing but inferiority complex, alienation from our traditions, whether it's in terms of uh, food habits, whether it's in dress, whether it's how we speak to each other, uh, you know, uh, social norms and so on and so forth. It affected all that. Uh, and of course, we became fascinated with colonizers' lifestyle and values. We want to adopt them. We want to shed ours. And the emergence of the special class of people who were actually colonized, but they acted like colonizers. You know, they call themselves, you know, we, I guess many of us are part of that, uh, you know, modern, liberal, secular, uh, global citizen, uh, Hindus in name only, or, um, you know, SBNRs. Uh, are spiritual but not not religious and so on and so forth. So um, and and of course all this causes makes us timid, makes us not wanting to stand up and you know uh, take a stand against uh, uh, these issues as, as as they come across. Now this colonial narrative continues to live beyond the colonial era uh, into the modern day, as uh, Kundan Singh Ji has pointed out, Professor Kundan Singh has pointed out, and that is. Uh, the genesis of modern day attitudes towards Hindus or Hindu Um However, that said, not everyone, uh, you know, is not, they, we are able to break the shackles of this colonized mind, at least in parts, at least some of us, and they become shining examples for us. So I've, I've, uh, uh, I'm showing here three examples uh, from the recent history uh, Lieutenant Colonel uh, Kamal Jee Singh Kalsi, he fought very hard against the U.S. Uh, uh, Army to let him serve in the U.S. Army uh, while wearing his uh, full Sikh gear, uh, turban and full beard. He ultimately won and, uh, you know, he's currently proudly serving in the, in the uh, medical corps as Lieutenant Colonel. Um, uh, Dr. Swati Mohan has been talked about in the chat room quite a bit. Uh, you know, I kind of feel bad for her because... You know, uh, her real accomplishment is actually landing the, the rover on Mars. Uh, but unfortunately, he's trending more for the fact that, you know, she is wearing a Hindu symbol uh, in, in a professional workspace, which is great as well. But I mean, I think kudos to her. But, uh, you know, let's also cheer her for the fact that, you know, uh, she accomplished a major engineering feat of delivering this, uh, uh, this vehicle to Mars. I came across Roma Gujarati uh, and um, I was, I, I held a uh, conference in Boston last year, sorry, in 2019. Uh, she was one of my panelists and uh, she gave a talk on her, uh, you know, lifestyle choices. And she told the audience that uh, she, very early on, she decided to wear bindi every day to school in spite of getting a lot of, uh, uh, you know, bad looks from her friends and uh, criticism. And now she's in uh, Boston College of Law and she continues to follow that. And I really like the quote, uh, you know, the very pithy quote she made. She said, simply put, I look different because I am different. And why should I be ashamed of that? I think we can give uh, three cheers to these, uh, these shining examples, you know, who are able to stand up, take, take a stand 
and uh, you know show their uh, their identity in professional uh, workspaces. Thank you. So uh, next slide, please. So we're constantly asked, uh, what should we do? How can we fight innovation? Uh, on, so on the next slide, I'm just offering some, some examples. Ranji, we're not able to... Uh... I, I, have, I have already gone to the next slide. Oh, okay. For some reason, uh, can everyone see the next slide that says... Uh, no, it's uh, not refreshed. No, it's not refreshed, not refreshed Yeah. Oh, sorry, sorry. Let me... Can you see it now? Yes, I can see it now. Thank you. Okay. All right. Great. So, uh, just sharing uh, some some personal thoughts on how we might be able to counter Indonesia. This, you know, first of all, let me let me point out that no one has a silver bullet. You know, this is not something that uh, uh, you know we can make a list of you know a, a, make a playbook or a list of ten things we could do and and uh, you know make it disappear. The other thing is. Uh, uh, last time we actually got a question from someone say, yes, we know Hindu Dwesha exists. So what is being done about it? Now that really, you know, uh, got my back up because, um, you know, it is not something that you can outsource source to someone else. The fight has to be personal. Everyone has to be a foot soldier in this fight. Okay. Uh, so that's, that's one thing. We have to ditch once and for all the idea that this is someone else's fight. Uh, we can give it to this organization or that organization to fight. Everyone has to be part of this, uh, you know, this, this struggle. The other thing is you really can't fight. Yeah, I mean, I can, I can tell you, go write to, uh, you know, uh, yeah, go write letters to uh, editors of newspapers, do this and that. But unless we educate ourselves on some basic facts, we really can't do it. I mean, we just, you know, emotions alone are not going to win this war. Uh, this has to be won with arguments. I mean, we truth is on, on, on our side, but we, know, we need to know what the truth is. We need to know some relevant historical facts. We need, need to know some of the key players and what they said. We can do this through, uh, we can achieve this through webinars like this, and there'll be many more webinars um, you know, we plan to hold one, roughly uh, once every four to five weeks. Um, there are a number of beautiful courses that HUA offers, the Hindu University of America offers uh, that, you know, that can give you a good perspective on, on these issues. Of course, there's always self-study, but we have to educate ourselves. We have to arm ourselves with some basic facts before we can go out in the public square and, and uh, put our views in a cogent fashion. The other point I like to make is taking a page from the three examples I shared in the last page on the last slide. Let's integrate at least one Hindu symbol into our public life. And I'm suggesting Om. Now, you know, just wearing Om around your neck is not going to uh, make Hindu Dwesha disappear, but it creates a coherence in the Hindu community. You know, you identify yourself as a soldier in this fight and it, maybe it creates a dialogue you know, if, if cross or star of David and all these other symbols, including hijab, can be accepted in the workplace, why not own? Um, finally, we have a number of projects. Um, uh, the, the Hindu Dwesha team has a number of projects, and I'll tell you uh, at least one of them. I think monitoring the, uh, the, the news media and various other communication channels and then writing reports on them on a quarterly or monthly, I mean, a yearly basis is a great way uh, to daylight the kind of Hindu dvesha that these, um, these organizations are uh, practicing. So we would like, uh, we would like people to uh, volunteer, um, you know, with, with us, join, join these projects. And please, you can, uh, you can write yourself, you know, you can volunteer through the, through the chat room. Uh, we'll, you know, so, connect with you. So, JG, uh, on that note, uh, Ankur, can you share the results of the poll that you conducted? Let's see what people are saying. <clears throat> Have you experienced Hindu Dvesha personally? Okay, 57% of the people are saying yes out of the 127 responses. Would you like to get involved in this Hindu Dvesha initiative? 109 of you are saying yes. 
Okay, may we get in touch with you? 130 of you are saying yes. Okay, <laughs> wonderful. That's <laughs> terrific, everybody. Okay, okay, we can close. We can close the poll, Ankur. Okay. So Wait. yeah, yeah. J- just on that note, I mean, you know, in on April 13, 1699, Guru Gobind Singh stood up in front of large audiences and said, you know, he needs people who would want to sacrifice themselves for saving the dharma. And he got five volunteers. Those five volunteers ultimately, uh, you know, gave rise. I mean, they changed the the the, the uh, course of history in India. If we could get five volunteers here, who could join us in uh, in some of the projects that we have, I think we would be, you know, would be uh, miles ahead. So yeah, 113 of you want to join. Uh, you know, I I would say if we had five volunteers, we would be making a big big change already. We've got a lot more here. Thank you so much. All right. Okay, everybody. Uh, I think that is the webinar for today. Uh, you know, um, we are almost out of time. So we've gone past by 30 minutes. So I think we'll end here and see you all again in the next webinar. And once from now, in the meantime, somebody will get in touch with you. Okay. Thank you all. Namaste. Namaste, everybody. Bye. Namaste. The last speaker was Dr. Jay Bansal. Uh, which is in the Parishad.